I woke up this morning to the Wizards Banyan Restricted announcement being no changes in Pioneer and thought I'd just roll back over and go back to sleep. Although I think Modern needed a little bit of a heavier hand, I thought that Pioneer was pretty safe and fair in the fact that there were no bans announced. However, before I closed my eyes, I made the mistake of checking social media afterwards and, well, I'm kind of surprised to say the least. Now as a fair warning, heads up, this is probably going to be a longer video since I'm going to be breaking down a lot of things. First off, I'm going to be going over why I feel that Wizards made the right choice for Pioneer at this moment in time with no bans. After that, I will be going over the decks and cards that are kind of quote unquote on the radar as far as potential bans in the future could go, starting and with addressing the community's concerns around the card and explaining why there is reasoning behind that, and then following up with it where I agree or disagree with those viewpoints and how I think that these cards or decks should be monitored going forward. I'll also be putting timestamps down below in the description for the different parts that I'm going to be talking about so you can just jump to the ones that are most relevant or interesting to you since I honestly don't know how long this video is going to be. There's a lot I can talk about and I could talk for days. Anyways, with a lot to talk about, let's get started right away with why I feel like no bans was the correct choice for Wizards to make right now. The biggest reason out there, or biggest two reasons out there right now is the fact that within the next month's time, there are big things that will have direct impacts on Pioneer. First off, it is the switching of the regional championship qualifier season from Standard over to Pioneer. And second is the release of the new set, Outlaws of Thunder Junction, which will be coinciding basically with when this RCQ season starts. Let's start off with that first point. Imagine after watching the last Pro Tour just a few weeks ago, you're learning the format if the upcoming qualifier season is going to be swapping to Pioneer, and you're deciding that you're going to start researching what decks to play so you can try and qualify. How would the optics of the format start to look if after you started doing research, buying cards so they have plenty of time to ship to you so you could bring them to your LGS to try them out before the qualifiers actually start and settle on a deck, only to realize that a bunch of the cards you ordered are now banned? Pretty awkward, yeah? I do think the timing of this BNR announcement limited what Wizards could do for Pioneer because it is going to be the next competitive format. Pro Magic events at their core are marketing events or marketing campaigns, and they no doubt wind up selling a lot of Murders at Karlov Manor products to stores and players alike hoping to stock up on Vein Rippers after the PT. Banning cards after a surge of primary and secondary market activity is going to churn players way more than them playing in a few events before they decide if the format is for them or not. This also doesn't say that Pro Magic is only meant to push product, but it does have a big influence on how players decide to play the game. So if they can't play the cards that were just at the recent Pro Tour, they're less likely to play your game. And to the second point, the upcoming set, we as players have no idea what is going to be released in future sets. Chances are, everything will not be as impactful as, say, Amalia was to a format like Pioneer, but we as players are not always the best at evaluating things, especially in Eternal formats. Vein Ripper and then the historic example of Death Shadow are reminders that we don't know everything about this game. So yes, there are chances that cards get printed in Outlaws that either hate on the current popular decks in the format, or there are cards that are powerful enough that they spring up entire new archetypes around themselves and end up diversifying the Pioneer format that way. Also, let's not forget that with the change to ban and restrict an announcement rules that Wizards can do an emergency ban announcement within three weeks of a set release. That means that we're not just going to get the standard and draft pro tour with pioneer side events for outlaws of thunder junction but we'll also have weeks of data from the rcq season to see if anything really does need to be dealt with immediately there's even time after modern horizons 3 where we could see another bnr announcement which would be more than enough time for players that have qualified for the pioneer regional championship to adjust their decks or adjust their strategy going into the event so with the pair of those points in mind, I think that Wizards has 100% made the correct decision to not ban anything in Pioneer right now. 
I keep stressing the fact that right now is important because I don't think that everything is peachy keen with Pioneer, and I don't think that every single deck is fair and balanced and that there aren't decks or cards that should be under a microscope to see if they get too far out of hand. Now, before we hop into those decks and cards themselves, I do want to go over a couple of what I am calling quote unquote community pillars to the Pioneer format. I think these topics continuously pop up around balance discussions and around banned and restricted announcements specifically. These are things that the community identifies as things that make Pioneer, Pioneer, not modern, not standard, its own unique format and things that I constantly see echoed across social media. Number one, no fetch lands. This is actually one that Wizards actually does uphold for now as the cons block fetches are explicitly banned and the rest of the fetch lands are not legal. They do not want mana fixing to be at the power level it is in modern, and while standard may have had them in previous iterations, Pioneer's card pool is much larger and therefore has more lands of basic land types that could be fetched for and abused than previous iterations of standard. Secondly, Pioneer is where you can play your delve spells. This one, a little controversial, but does go hand in hand with rule number one of no fetches. Banned and modern for being too easy to enable with fetch lands and other cheap graveyard filling effects like the long forgotten faithless looting that has been banned out, treasure cruise, dig through time, and the lesser remembered temporal trespass, unless you play Phoenix, are cards that get more busted the less mana that you need to invest in them. Currently, there's a cost to filling your graveyard for Pioneer, yes, even if you're playing a Phoenix deck, and certain decks can use these cards better than others, but it's not to the out of hand level that it was when they were legal and modern. This pillar has a lot of fans on its side, but also a lot of fans that are against it. I tend to view this one as being split between churned or returning players against newer players to the format where the churned players or returning players love that they can use their old cards that they may have left modern because they couldn't play anymore, and the new players don't get how these busted old designs are legal in a newer format. And the third pillar is Pioneer is where you can play your old standard decks. And man, I love it when this one gets thrown around. A lot of people take this at face value and the fact that you should be able to just jam something like Jeskai Black or Mono Black Devotion and just run amok with wins like they used to in their standard heyday. In reality, this point kind of applies more like old extended did, where archetypes have overlap with their standard counterparts, but they evolve and change a little bit more with a larger card pool. Also in the same vein of reality, I wish this was more understood as a point of pioneers where you can play old standard cards, because that's how it actually winds up panning out. That and the fact that old standard cards are not cons block from 2014 anymore. These are cards from War of the Spark, Throne of Eldraine, Theros Beyond Death, and Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. And now I could really, really dig into how we got into this era of magic, but I think that could be its own video on the falling and rising power level and the stake that fire design had when designing current magic cards. Regardless, people want to be able to play their favorite cards from rotated formats, and for the most part, Pioneer is where they can do it. There's a cap on when cards got introduced to the format, since it's not as old and going back as far as modern is, but they still freely let new cards flow in from standard and interact with the cards we've played with already for years. I love this mix for Pioneer. Please don't ruin it with Horizon Sets and Pioneer. Now, none of these are hard wizard's rules, except for maybe the fetches one, and they are not sacred and untouchable to the format. Wizards could change the perception of these in a heartbeat, but I do think these are the things I like to keep in mind when I'm discussing changes to the Pioneer format overall, because I feel like these are the most easily identifiable things as to what Pioneer's real draw in or identity is to people that play it. So when I look at the decks that I see people complaining about right now, I keep these things in mind. So speaking of these decks, I've seen three main ones that get a lot of recurring complaints recently, and among them are some cards that I, they like to discuss for being up to being on the band, the ban hammer, chopping block kind of thing. I'm going to go through them one at a time, and my points will be focused on those decks and cards within the scope of Pioneer. Now, the first of those decks is the largest metagame share, Pro Tour Murders at Karlov Manor, the Is It Menace itself, Is It Phoenix. 
I've seen Reddit threads and pro players alike talking about how powerful this deck is, inciting the fact that it had a 57.5% win rate at the recent Pro Tour, while also being the most played deck in the room. And I can't fault them for that. They're right to identify that a large win rate with a large presence in general is an outlier when it comes to normal distribution statistics. We'll break down that rate in a little bit. The other big complaint I see from the community specifically regarding Phoenix is that Treasure Cruise is too powerful in the deck and that a fair graveyard base spell enabled creature combo deck, it could be too fast to deal with and there are less ways to deal with the Phoenix for good on the battlefield than if it stays in the graveyard. For those not in the know, Treasure Cruise is a delve spell that can be reduced to a singleton blue mana to draw three cards, harkening back to a power nine card Ancestral Recall. Drawing three cards for one mana early is strong to pull ahead in tempo of the game, and then drawing three cards for one mana or two mana if you want to save cards in your graveyard for your Phoenix combo later on is still extremely powerful, and doing this allows you to bait counter magic and or keep the mana open to pay for things like no more lies and your phoenixes only care about casting not resolving now is it phoenix specifically can nibble this card as soon as turn three thanks to a specific combination of cards that can be played at instant speed consider and the adventure side of picklock prankster consider puts the card itself into the graveyard but also allows you to surveil a card like an Arclight Phoenix, into your graveyard. Playing the adventure side of Picklock Prankster named Free the Fey allows you to mill the top four cards of your deck and place an instant or sorcery from among them into your hand, like a treasure cruise. This means you're gonna have a minimum of four cards, maximum of five cards in your graveyard as you untap for your turn three. Any combination of one mana spells now gives you a minimum of six, maximum of seven cards in your graveyard and if you have another consider, you can have eight cards with a phoenix among them in your graveyard, delving away the seven that aren't phoenix to cast treasure crews, draw three more cards, and then if you've already played two spells, that's your third. If not, you've found your third spell to bring the phoenix into play, swinging immediately for three damage. Now, when you're discussing phoenix, there is a lot to unpack from the community side, since it is a very popular and very powerful deck but these seem to be the most repeated issues that I've heard about the archetype in general. I want to start by first addressing the win rate and metagame presence that people are bringing up. And here's the breakdown thanks to Frank Carson. I have my own breakdown in my own metagame recap video where I break apart the deck up archetypes a little bit further, but Frank's graphic is very clean and easy to read. Yes, the deck has a 57.5% win rate at the Pro Tour in the hands of pro players as one of the highest pilot skill level dependent decks in the format. I keep harping on the fact that this linear deck like Phoenix are more powerful in the hands of a better player than an average player. So while in the hands of Jean-Emmanuel de Pra, the deck will reflect its super high win rate and it's not going to be doing the same thing at your LGS meta, unless you go to the same LGS as Jean-Emmanuel, then checkmate me, I guess. Now the anecdotal parts aside, the other discourse I see a lot is that Phoenix had a target on its back and it still did well at the Pro Tour. And I just don't agree with that assessment at all. The most played decks at the Pro Tour were obviously Phoenix, Azorius Control, and Rakdos Midrange. Even if you want to include the top performing version of Rakdos, which was Rakdos Vampires in this conglomeration of decks, Phoenix had a favorable matchup into all three of them. So you're already the most played deck in the room, and you got a great matchup against the other most played decks in the room. That's already a recipe for a very strong winning record. Doing the math, looking at Frank's graphic here, Phoenix was 169 and 125 across all non-mirror matches at the Pro Tour. Subtracting the three decks I mentioned from its record leaves us with a combined record of 89 wins and 86 losses. That's a 50.9% win rate and it looks way more balanced than that 57.5% number already. According to Karsten's math on this graphic, Phoenix had a losing matchup against Lotus Field Combo, Amalia Combo, and Boris Heroic. Now I took the liberty in my version of breaking it down a little bit further and breaking it out across all decks that were played at the Pro Tour, putting Phoenix at a losing win rate against these matchups. Boros Convoke, Rakdos Sacrifice, Abzan Greasefang and Quintorius combo. And this is when we're looking at decks that it had at least two or more matchups played against. So no one and done kind of gotchas there. 
I also broke down the Lotus Field decks into different archetypes with the Dramoka only, Combo only, and Proctor Lotus versions being winning matchups into Phoenix. Now I'm not sold on things like Rakdos Sack being a winning matchup for Phoenix. I play Rakdos Sacrifice as my deck I always go back to, and I hate playing against Phoenix, especially with the Crackling Drake sideboard plan. But the rest I can see being difficult for Phoenix to deal with. Because of this, I'm not entirely sold on the fact that the Pro Tour was stacked against Phoenix like people say it was, as only a handful of these decks were actually represented in the top 10 presence decks at the event. I'm also not sold that the deck absolutely needs a ban because of this, and instead maybe just needs a meta shift the way that the meta pioneer did to combat Azorius Control being the best deck in a post-Amalia world at the time. This means maybe relying a little less on your unlicensed hearse and being less attached to your Gigantha companion, playing some rest in peace, and playing Leyline of the Void rather than just relying on something that takes two cards out of their graveyard, just shut off the delve mechanic entirely against the deck. Now, as for cards that should be watched from the deck because it is powerful, especially in the hands of pro players, and I think that it could use some fine tuning, I'm still not looking at Treasure Cruise for a ban. I think that the quote unquote nut draw for Phoenix is a low enough percentage to happen that it's not super strong and oppressive and it happens on turn three as opposed to something like a grief scan in modern hitting before you even have a chance to interact with it on your turn zero or turn one. I do, however, think that the cards enabling Delve to be stronger than it was originally should be looked at heavily. Looking back at older Pioneer metagames, Treasure Cruise wasn't an issue when pieces of the puzzle was the way that players chose to enable the card, which increases the best play for Phoenix from turn three to turn four just by the fact that pieces of the puzzle cost three mana. It's also a sorcery speed card, which makes Phoenix use its entire own turn to set up this combo rather than holding up interaction and playing the instant speed enabler that it does now. For these reasons, I would keep my eyes on Picklock Prankster, or more importantly, the adventure side, Free the Fey, as the card to ban out. I think that banning Treasure Cruise over this just enables Dig Through Time off of Free the Fey instead, which would be the same turn speed as Treasure Cruise and Pieces of the Puzzle in combination, only you pay an extra mana to see two additional cards overall, and you get to choose from them rather than blind drawing into them and having RNG kind of leave it up to the fates if the Phoenix deck is going to pop off that turn or not. It also gives Phoenix a card with multiple uses, since you now have a 1-3 stone wall against creature decks that also enables your combo. So I think the fairy might be more of the issue than the cruise. And this of course doesn't absolve Treasure Cruise from being a broken card in, down the line in a future set release or a future iteration of the format. So if Delve overall is something that players enjoy, but is something that is limiting their design space when it comes to cards that are good for Pioneer, then yeah, Treasure Cruise should probably kick the bucket. But right now, I don't think that's the issue, and I think that the enablers are the things that are really exacerbating this card. Now let's move on to the second deck that I see a lot of people arguing needs a ban from the deck, Amalia Combo. This deck was the bee's knees when Discover bit the bullet and was even heavily discussed during the spoiler season for Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Turns out, having a combo that can instantly grow something to 20 power and clear the enemy side of the board is pretty powerful. Now, for those that are unfamiliar with the deck's combo, you need to have a Wild Growth Walker and an Amalia in play with a way to explore or to gain life. This sets off a chain reaction of triggers, exploring and gaining life until Amalia's 20 power clause is met and she rats the entire board of everything except for herself. The real power of the deck though is the small life gain creatures and the explore creatures that wind up enabling this combo and then being able to use them for instant speed ways to find said combo like Collected Company, or more importantly, convoking them so you can use Court of Calling to find the combo pieces whenever you need them at instant speed. Amalia having a favorable board wipe means that the main complaints against this deck are from other creature-based decks. Fair mid-range decks, 
aggro decks and kindred creature type base decks are the ones that feel the most oppressed by Amalia and crew, and they often don't pack the correct removal or removal at instant speed and they also don't tend to be fast enough to win before this combo can be assembled well also because it can be assembled as early as turn three and more consistently on turn four some decks just don't have ways to stop the combo at all and just feel powerless as a 2020 beats down their once flooded board state for practically free some players really don't like the birthing pod aspect feel to the deck where it can tutor up for an instant win combination if you ever tap out and try to win the game i mean at least birthing pod was sorcery speed right not to mention the deck uses life gain as a huge buffer where even if you deal with the first part of the combo they stack up an amount of life that just normal creature decks can't beat before they combo for a second or a third time the addition of Aetherflux Reservoir also means that they could just blast you for 50 damage if they find it during their Surveil combo, and if you survive an attack. Oh, did I mention that they could always just run Dina Soul Steeper so they don't even have to attack? This leads to the deck having a presence in the Pioneer metagame that does wind up pushing out all these other fair creature-based and aggressive decks, forcing the format to adapt to a more control style interactive black x mid-range deck style or a combo deck in order to just race the amalia combo itself we've seen a decline in decks like mono white humans and azoria spirits specifically that were extremely popular previously and would have absolutely thrived in a metagame with exorious control as the top dog pointing to amalia's oppression in the format now the other issue that I see people talking about all the time is the fact that it can be interacted with in a way that forces drawn games. As seen at the previous Pro Tour, if you skip Amalia from 19 power to 20 power before that final explore trigger happens, she goes to 21 power instead and actually never gets the blow up the world effect as it's tied to exploring for the 20th power not triggered on hitting 20 power in general. So that means that decks like Boros Heroic can force the deck to stall out entirely by just giving Amalia plus one plus zero with Defiant Strike. This causes the game to end in a draw, which isn't counted in your match record. So you shuffle up and play again as if the game didn't happen. It's actually happened twice in the semifinals of the Pro Tour, if I'm not mistaken, which meant that they played seven games in a best of five series match, which in all honesty should have been renamed to first to three, specifically in this case. Oh, did I mention that Dina stops this and just wins if they can Cord or Coco into it? Yeah. So there's obviously a lot of outcry to just ban Amalia itself, or you can be on the opposite side where you keep the newer card, the more fun card, and you ban Wild Growth Walker so that the combo is effectively dead, and you just need to play a more fair life gain or explore strategy in order to get there slower, sort of like a heroic style deck, but in Golgari. Banning anything in this deck effectively kills the archetype entirely, as pieces for the quote unquote toolbox type deck have always been in pioneer but without a way to instantly win the game the way the old birthing pod deck did in modern there was little appeal to actually building one so no amalia no walker no abs and toolbox deck in pioneer now to start i agree that what amalia does to the format is a little stifling for creature based decks what it does is push you in two directions with your deck idea you either need to go into a black based mid-range deck so that you have access to hand disruption and instant speed, more importantly, cheaply costed removal for the combo, or you get pushed into a smaller pump spell based package where you hold up your own ways to win the game in order to not lose the game. If you have a slower game plan or your interaction doesn't line up well at instant speed, such as a card like Brutal Cathar, you're out of luck against Amalia. You could go to the route of stopping life gain effects entirely, but that's also another black and red based mechanic in Pioneer. So we're back to the same choice of decks that you have to play to stop it. And while I agree what Amalia does to the format isn't entirely healthy, I do think that Amalia suffers additional flack for pushing favored decks out of the format entirely, such as mono white humans or Azoria spirits, 
when it wasn't really Amalia's fault. Bear with me here. Lost Caverns of Ixalan was released on November 17th, 2023. There was an update to the banned and restricted list on December 4th of 2023. That means that Amalia and company got to play in a world with Karn, overshadowed by Discover, for exactly 17 days. Well, why is this important information? Well, let's take a look at how the format looked between June 7th of 2022 and the ban and restricted update on December 4th of 2023. It's a lot of information. Thanks to Magic the Gathering Meta for being able to provide this information on screen, we know that Mono Green Devotion was the second most played deck at the time with 7,996 recorded games on MTG meta, and Rakdos Midrange was in the number one spot with 11,149 games recorded on MTG meta. Azorius Control, Abzan Greasefang, and Izzet Phoenix were also up there, with Mono White Humans actually being the third most played deck, while Azorius Spirits actually didn't even make it into the top 10. Now, this is important information because looking at this data, we can see that both of these decks were extremely good against Mono Green Devotion and not good into Rakdos Midrange or even Rakdos Sacrifice at the time. So by Karn being banned and taking out the entire Mono Green deck with it, these decks immediately, just like that, lost one of their best matchups in the format. At the same time, we saw a decrease in the Lotus Field combo decks, thanks to decks like Boros Convoke rising in popularity, which was another good matchup removed from these decks. What replaced them at the top of the metagame? Ah, that's right, Amalia combo. So while yes, I do not deny that Amalia would absolutely destroy decks like these, I think the problem is exacerbated by the fact that the Karn ban did just as much, if not more, damage to these decks by taking away their good matchups. Overnight, they lost good matchups and gained a very popular bad one, while Rakdos decks also steadily increased and then also now has a secondary version in Vampires to boot. If Mono Green still had a portion of the metagame share, albeit lower than it would be without Amalia in the format, Spirits of Mono White would have higher representation and higher win rates because of it. But that's not the case with current Pioneer, so those decks got double destroyed just by LCI's release. Now, I also don't believe that every single deck should be answerable via sorcery speed interaction, but I do think that decks that are creature-based instant win combinations like Amalia need to have some form of stopgap weakness for decks that play fair games to be able to attack them properly. Black and red, they have ways to do this already, but the other colors, like, you know, Azorius, really don't in creature-based decks. I would love to see design explore the space of, let's say, a flash speed Skyclave Apparition, but you need to have the downside be significant enough so that's not incredibly overpowered. Maybe even specifically saying it can only target things that are two mana or less, or only target creatures that are two mana or less, something to kind of balance out the flash speed of this interaction effect. In the future, I would also like to see them shy away from two mana combo pieces as well, at least forcing a deck to use a mana dork in order to get a three cost combo piece out on turn two, which then leaves these fair decks a window to interact with said mana creature to stop the combo. Now, as far as the tied game point goes, I think this is the weakest argument for Amalia decks needing to have a ban. Now, I may lose a lot of you here in the comments and I might die on this hill, but I don't think ties are inherently bad for magic events. This is an entirely different scenario we're dealing with than the Yorian or Sensei's Dividing Tops decks in other formats, as these draws from Amalia combo get decided instantly when they're presented, either by the Amalia deck finding Dina or both players just shuffling up for another game. I also find that this interaction actively deters people from playing Amalia in Pioneer. Not having agency over how a game or matchup goes mean the deck is less appealing when people start taking advantage of this drawn game mechanic. It is actively beneficial for the opponent to do this, and the Amalia player gets frustrated that they must effectively lose a game that is all but won and locked up. 
this will naturally control its metagame share as newer players shy away from the deck because of an interaction that feels unfair to them, coming from the Amalia side. Now, it's also very important to state that MTG Wiki cites rule 2.1 for match completion as such. A magic match consists of a series of games that are played until one side has won a set number of games, usually two. It could be three if you're in a best of five scenario. Drawn games do not count towards this goal. If the round ends before a player has won the required number of games, the winner of that match is the player who has won the most games at that point. If both players have equal game wins, the match is a draw. That specifically means that the rounds for Amalia won't end in draws, at least for established players. You must win two games and you cannot end 0-0-3 like some people seem to believe. The immediate restarting clause for the game tied and speed of the decks that caused the game state means that in Swiss rounds of events, you're unlikely to end in a draw unless a player is still new and learning the deck, which can happen with any deck and is not an Amalia specific issue. Now this only really becomes an issue with untimed play rounds, like the top eight of an RCQ, a regional championship, or other pro level events. The only real detriment to the rules it stands now would be things like this as waiting around for friends at a local RCQ or the store owner needing to stay later as a semi-final goes to four plus games because of restarts can be super super annoying. There's also merit to the fact that seeing this happen at the pro level on a broadcast repeatedly would lead to viewer fatigue of the format and paint it in a negative light. With an esports broadcast background, I can say that boring metagames and League of Legends and stale Valorant compositions are very big detriments to a viewer experience for an esport broadcast. And remember when I mentioned earlier in the day, or earlier in the video, that the pro level events are marketing events for Wizards of the Coast. So they want people to be excited about this stuff. They don't want them getting bored of a product that they really just want them to go out and buy. However, I do think this can be addressed if and when we get Amalia being in another top eight of a high level event with coverage. As in the previous Pro Tour, there was only one copy of Amalia that barely made it to the top eight. And then this of course also requires the decks that can abuse this loop to also make it to the top eight. So it's a very, very small window for untimed round coverage. And then during the Swiss events, you can cut away if the games go too long or if the ties keep restarting the game and it gets to be boring for viewers. As far as cards on my radar go, I'm really looking at just Wild Growth Walker for a potential ban for the deck. I think that leaving Amalia for potential life gain combos that play at a slower place, like a Heliod or Angels type deck for example, it's a fine place for a newer card to sit even if it never sees competitive play because it's a fun deck that people can play at their local game store. We've had Wild Growth Walker in the format for a long time already too, and this is the first time it's actually seeing play in Pioneer, and it's to enable a potential instant win combination, so I think it's actually pretty safe to ban that card out without any sort of lasting impacts on future design space as well, whereas exploring an Amalia could potentially be explored, of course, in a future set design. Now, so as much as I talked about this one, I'm more aligned to a Wild Growth Walker ban outright than basically anything else I'm going to talk about in this video here. I just think the reasons people have to arrive at the decision aren't correct for the health of the format over time or how things could wind up being developed in future sets. Now, lastly, on the list of things to talk about, we kind of have more of a card than a deck archetype but I'm gonna talk about both of them anyway. This card does slot into Rakdos decks all over the place and does a lot for them that they've lacked in previous iterations and older formats. So Fable of the Mirror Breaker, as you may have expected, is a card that has been on the tip of everybody's tongue during ban discussions for seemingly ever since the card was printed at this point. The card is just a mishmash of powerful effects on their own with a way too easy to achieve mana costing cast and way too much that does even if the saga itself is answered. At first glance, creating a 2-2 creature for 3 mana, not great. But the fact that that creature gives you treasure tokens means that not killing it immediately ramps your opponents to 5 mana on turn 4, 7 mana on turn 5, you get the deal. 
don't deal with the saga immediately, well, now your opponent gets to discard two of the worst cards of the current situation and just draw two more. Maybe even the perfect answer. And after the card reflips into Reflection of Hikijiki, your opponent is threatening to copy their best non-legendary creature. Like... Vein Ripper, for instance. It also gets better with multiple copies, since the flip side itself is not legendary. So you can just copy another reflection, untap, and make as many copies as mana as you have. The card gets incredible amounts of value for just a 3 mana investment overall. And this would just be so much harder to play, by the way, and therefore more balanced if it cost multiple red mana like the namesake of the card. Outside of the card itself, Fable does something to specifically Rakdos decks that kind of slaps duct tape on a problem hole for the deck as a whole that's been around for a while. Card selection. Now let me take you down the old dusty trail and do a story of Boomer Jun decks and Modern to set us up for some context because that's pretty much the biggest analogy deck that you could find to this deck in Pioneer right now. Jun decks used to be known as toolbox decks and no not because you could tutor for the right tool all the time but because they had basically every single piece of relevant interaction in the format shoved into a 60 card deck because jund had all the answers discard spells targeted removal direct damage threatening sized creatures and powerful planeswalkers the deck's weakness, however, was that sometimes you ended up pulling out the wrong tool for the job because you had no card draw in these colors. You had to circumvent this in one of two ways, or you could just do both of them. Painful ways to draw cards that could be shut down easily, such as Dark Confidant, or mechanics that let you get two things for the price of one, like Cascade on Bloodbright Elf. Turns out, Cascade was deemed too powerful for a while, so these decks relied on just Bob for their card advantage for basically ever. However, now Fable of the Mirror Breaker just covers this weakness in two different ways. Its second chapter is the most obvious one. It lets you discard two of those useless tools and draw up to two potential correct tools for the job, which is a lot when your deck is full of powerful, aggressively costed interaction spells. Secondly, it's the first chapter of Fable the Mirror Breaker, which harkens back to that two for one value as it creates a token that also creates treasures, meaning you can jump your mana curve to cast multiple spells in a turn or enable revolt for fatal push. I could also rant an entire video about how the ease of access to treasure tokens as a way to even the playing field for colors that don't traditionally have access to ramp or kind of cover their weaknesses in limited for mana value and mana color access is blurring and distorting the lines of the color pie together in unexpected ways like this fatal push example. But just know that treasures are part of the issue and Rakdos is the best mid-range deck in Pioneer at generating and using them right now. Fable combines expertly with another card that's been printed in recent times to cover this card selection weakness, which also happens to maybe be one of the most pushed uncommons of all time, if not definitely the one that I've seen in the long time. Blood Tithe Harvester. It creates blood tokens when it enters the battlefield, which allow you to cash in on a mana and a card for a new one from your deck. This, of course, also enables Revolt, which continues to beat on the fact that black is the best color because of the mechanics, they continue to push the power level of Fatal Push and allows you to loot away bad situational cards for the chance at finding your perfect answer. It also doubles as a removal spell in and of itself as it wipes out things that double the size of your blood tokens. Two of these can quite kill a Shieldred, but it can wipe out just about everything else in the format, really. Oh yeah, and using the removal spell also triggers Revolt, because why the hell not? Oh, it's also a 3-2 for 2 mana, because it didn't have enough text on it already to make it playable, so why not make a green stat body on top of Rakdos colors? And to like further seal the synergy between the two cards, Harvester is also one of, if not the best target for Fable's flip side, the Reflection of Kikijiki. Because each copy enters, it makes a blood token so they add to the amount of killing power that their ability has by two for each copy that you make. These copies also have haste and will disappear at the end of a turn. So you just activate the copy and suddenly you have a disfigure on a stick at worst and a tragic slip like effect at best. Well, okay, it can't ever be 13 because it's an even number, but you, you get what I mean. I, I just wanted to use the anime art. 
Now, all of this talk about Rakdos, and we haven't even gotten to the most recent addition to the deck, and the thing that people in the format are discussing the power level of currently, which is Soren Imperius Bloodlord and Vein Ripper combo. In case you haven't seen, Soren is a three mana planeswalker with two plus abilities and an immediately castable ultimate, which technically makes him better than Oko on paper. All right, well, comparisons aside though, the ultimate lets you put any vampire from your hand directly into play. So why not a six drop that has an impossible ward cost for control decks to play and provides value if they kill it or anything else you have in play? Seems pretty fair. People jokingly refer to this one-two punch combination as uh, Soren Tell, which I think is amazing, and it has proven strong enough to get two decks into the top eight of the most recent Pro Tour, including the deck that won the entire event piloted by Seth Manfield. While some of this was the surprise factor of this deck being an unknown quantity, it's hard to deny that a turn three combo that is not an instant win, but a powerful swing of momentum that even current ramp decks really can't achieve is a fair and balanced thing to do for the already strong grindy mid-range deck that they just plop down in front of you with all the hand disruption and removal back up in the world. Now, I do agree with a lot of these points about Rakdos as an archetype specifically, but I don't share the same feelings about the ubiquitous hating and advocating for a ban on Fable of the Mirror Breaker. No, I'm not going to defend its power level in the Rakdos decks after pointing out how strong it is, but the reason I am skeptical on banning Fable for now is the fact that I believe it has become a cornerstone card for the format and banning it right now will do extremely harsh games to the metagame and that should not be done during a competitive season. Let's talk hypotheticals here. If you were to remove Fable of the Mirror Breaker from the format, it does affect the Rakdos decks a bit. However, with blood tokens and more ways to make them in the format, as well as some red exile for value cards like Inti and other spells available, the deck probably stays relevant, although not tier one anymore, unless the Sor and Tell combo is powerful enough to carry it there. Now decks like Azorius Control, Lotus Field Combo, Amalia Combo, and even any of the Boros decks don't use this card at all. So banning it does nothing to them if not buffing some of their matchups that make this deck stronger than they already are. Fable is also all but absent from Is It Phoenix decks, which is the most played deck with red in it in the format. Sure, it's a blue based deck and some lists do pack one or two in the sideboard, but is that really nerfing Phoenix decks? Instead, a Fable ban hurts the decks that are fighting in tier two and below harder than any of the top decks in the format, and I think that's where I have the biggest issue with banning this card. Let's walk through more examples. Now, decks like Creativity, they use Fable as a cornerstone in the deck to hold together its rough draws, find its combo pieces, and enable the combo by creating a goblin or a treasure token to execute its game plan. Decks like Enigmatic Fires are another example of a deck that uses Fable as a way to generate value to ramp through, say, a Fires of Invention into larger target turns, while also providing something to sacrifice to get a four drop creature. Without Fable, the Karuga version surely ceases to exist, while the Yorian version will have to rely on Up the Beanstalk and Omen of the Seas combination to try to find its way to its relevant spells that it needs. Hell, even decks like Niv to Light run four copies of Fable to find the cards it wants and copy some of its non-legendary effects. And that deck really only wants to see dual colored cards and Valky, maybe an Elish Nord. Banning Fable, utterly destroys the foundation for a lot of these lower tier decks and it does so much that it's not easily replaceable with a four of another card let alone two copies of two other cards that do similar parts to what fable can do just by itself i do however have fable on my watch list for bands as the season progresses but i highly doubt that Wizards touches the card without it being the off-season for Pioneer because it will completely flip the metagame on its head when they do so. And you know what? I'm not writing that off as a reason to ban it. It's a valid point. I just think it's going to be after this RCQ season and potentially before the actual Pro Tour or RC that features Pioneer so that the players who have qualified have plenty of time to adjust to a new metagame and find a deck 
potentially debuting it at the Pro Tour the way that Rakdos Vampires did at Pro Tour and Kim recently. So like that actually kind of is a very solid storyline and might be where Wizards actually bans it. However, the other card that I've advocated for banning for a very long time though is Blood Tithe Harvester. If you couldn't tell from my tone of voice when talking about the card. I think that that card powers down Raxos decks a ton if it's banned, forcing them to cover their weaknesses with either Inti and Smuggler's Copter, which do kind of the creature impression and potentially card selection parts, or just more kill spells like Go for the Throat and Bitter Triumph in order to cover the removal aspect of the card. Both these creature replacements do require additional steps to get the value instead of just a 3 damage body on a 2 mana value casting cost creature, and neither of them enable Revolt for Fatal Push, so that's a huge plus. Banning Harvester takes all the versions of Rakdos down a peg while keeping the tier 2 decks afloat for now. But if they do wind up banning Fable anyway, I would not touch Blood Tithe Harvester with a 10 foot pull as that's about 90% of the way to killing the Rakdos deck entirely. I think it actually hurts the deck more than if Shieldred were to get banned. So that's what I think about Pioneer right now and why I think Wizards is right to not ban anything for now. There's still a lot to come in the next few months with a new set of cards and iteration through the RCQ season. So let me know in the comments below how you feel about the format as a whole, if you agree or disagree about what I've identified about the format and how I would approach it, and if there's a deck you have your eyes on, of course, for the upcoming RCQ season. I'm probably gonna be doing a series of deck techs for Pioneer the same way I did for Standard, so keep your eyes peeled. If you stuck through with me this entire time for this incredibly long video, thank you so much for watching. It helps me out a lot to just thumbs up the video, even if you disagree with me, and make sure that you remember to tap that subscribe button to be notified of more deck techs, metagame analysis, and in general, magic content. Thank you again for watching, and see you later.